Traces of civilizations that were born, grew, and then disappeared over the centuries can be found in most countries around the world. Sometimes they perished from unknown causes, sometimes they were destroyed by the violent onslaughts of new conquerors. The ruins we admire today emerge from the mists of time. Many of them are perfectly aligned astronomically, with huge stones molded into elaborate forms that are truly astonishing feats of engineering. Structures so massive and sophisticated that they would be a challenge even to modern technology. Some of the most fascinating archaeological sites in the world are in Peru. These have been carefully studied for many years, leading to the discovery of traces which range from faint to surprising, impossible to interpret with the tools and knowledge we currently possess. Traces can be found in the ancient remains, in archaic myths, in the oral traditions handed down from lost people, even in the chronicles of the conquistadores. Gods who mingled with men and built fantastic cities bound by massive walls. Mysterious tunnels that are believed to have once linked these ancient sites. Bearers of knowledge and civilization. Divinities who traveled the four corners of the earth and knew how to fly. There is a strange similarity between the ruins and myths found in many parts of the world, almost an echo of a long-lost forgotten civilization, a highly developed breed of superior beings who disappeared thousands of years ago. A mother culture we have no memory of. Attracted by the mystery and magnetic pull of these places, we set off to explore them and capture their essence on film. Lima greeted us in a welter of color and noise. Founded by Francisco Pizarro in 1535, Lima is the modern capital of Peru, its largest city with a population of almost 8 million. We were welcomed to the Lima Geographical Society by the president, Admiral Raúl Paramassa. Helped by him and the honorary president, Dr. Santiago Antunes de Maiolo. We consulted various maps to decide on the best itineraries and to see what data the Geographical Society had on the themes we were researching. We explored their library, looking for further evidence to back up our own findings. The Society has some very important historical documents in its archives. Founded in 1888, it is in constant touch with the other Peruvian institutes and universities it collaborates with. Much has already been explored, but there is still so much to discover. There are still unexplored areas in Peru. For example, I found a reference in a book to a temple. I think it was called Tumpos Caica, above Caras, which has two underground tunnels, but nobody knows exactly where they are and nobody has explored them yet. And many other tunnels have been discovered in other parts of Peru. The same goes for Trevin. We don't know all about that either. Trevin hasn't been explored. Next we went to see Professor Federico Kaufmann Doig, one of Peru's leading archaeologists. He gave his views on the underground tunnels. There's a book on tunnels, it was published around 1880, all about the traditions. Anyway, what's interesting is that today, but even when I was a child, wherever you go, you hear about these tunnels. I think it ought to be looked into. Not just at Cusco, because we didn't get very satisfactory results there. But around the country, in all those places where people say, there's a tunnel here, there's the entrance to a tunnel. We ought to put all the information together. It's very interesting, it's something that really should be done, to make the past come alive again. Given all the information we had, we decided to start our adventure in Cusco. 
The 600-mile trip in the jeeps from Lima to Cusco isn't easy. The road runs through a desert, almost like the surface of the moon. We feel a bit alienated. Even more so because the plateaus are really high and the lack of oxygen makes everything more tiring. Tiny clumps of houses break the monotony every now and again. And occasionally, we see the friendly face of a llama or something very like it. Occasionally, unexpected hitchhikers thumb a lift, ephemeral visions which appear out of nowhere. On account of various problems, and even some landslides which had blocked the way, we end up in Cusco after 27 hours on the road, absolutely exhausted by the effort and the altitude. Cusco is 11,200 feet above sea level and has a population of 300,000. The ancient Inca Empire was called Taiwantesuyo. Cusco was its capital. Cusco means navel of the world. Here you can still see the remains of ancient Inca buildings and temples that the Spanish incorporated into their own buildings. Some of them are particularly interesting from a construction point of view, so surprisingly sophisticated that they would represent a challenge even to modern builders. This dry stone wall is really astonishing. Huge blocks of stone weighing hundreds of pounds in solid granite, delicately chiseled and fitted one on top of the other without any mortar apparently haphazardly, shaped as if they'd been made of soft plastic clay. How were these massive stones transported and set in place? How could the people of this ancient civilization fit them together so perfectly without the help of modern technology? The Incas hadn't discovered the wheel, but their building techniques bear witness to an amazing knowledge of engineering and architecture. This stone has 12 corners and fits perfectly into the ones around it. You couldn't get a knife blade between them, but no mortar has been used. It weighs hundreds of pounds, but it isn't one of the largest. On the other side of the building, the stones form a pattern representing the outline of a puma. Amazingly clever craftsmanship. There's a stone with 14 corners on the wall of a nearby building. It's smaller than the other, but the craftsmanship and its polygonal shaping is still wonderful. And there are still plenty of surprises to see in the Inca capital. A promontory rising on the outskirts of the city dominates Kutsko. This is the site of the ruins of Saksai Yuaman, said to be a fortress, or possibly a temple, or perhaps both. We don't really know. The only sure things are the incredible huge blocks of stone used to build its massive walls. Once again, we find shaped stones which fit perfectly together. But this time, we're talking about blocks that are 26 feet high and weigh over 300 tons. An impossible giant puzzle, designed by a superman. Back in the 17th century, the writer Gazilazo de la Vega, after visiting the walls of Saksai Yuaman, said in his royal commentaries of the Incas, it seems as if they were built by some form of magic, a work carried out by demons rather than mortal men. How did the Indios manage to quarry the stones, transport them, work them, and then build walls with such precision? They had no iron or steel to perforate the rock with, and to cut and smooth the blocks. 
They had no carts and no oxen to transport them. And in truth, there are no carts or oxen anywhere in the world strong enough to carry out a similar task given the huge size of the stones and the difficult mountain paths they traveled over. This monolith is amazing. And this one, it's huge and fits in perfectly with the ones around it. Really breathtaking. Saksai Yuaman's massive walls are built on three levels. Each level is a perfectly leveled terrace. The wonderful pattern of enormous stone blocks fitting together perfectly is repeated on each level. The extremely precise joins are repeated over and over again. Who designed and built this gate? They must have been giants. To make a comparison, we moved to a site a few miles out of Kutsko. We went to see a building that has been historically identified as a fortress. It's called Puka Pukara. Puka Pukara means the Red Fortress, so-called because of the color of the rock used to build it. Strategically placed to dominate the surrounding countryside, the Incas were able to control and defend one of the approaches to Cuzco from here. The building technique is undoubtedly less sophisticated here than at Saksayuaman and Cuzco. The stones are much smaller. You can see that an attempt has been made to copy the polygonal pattern we admired before, but even if the blocks are much smaller, the workmanship is rougher and the stones don't fit together as well. Our doubts increase. Did the Incas really build the walls we saw in Cuzco and the huge structures at Saksai Yuaman? The discrepancy between the sites makes it seem doubtful. We walk over the whole complex, but the workmanship on the walls is the same everywhere. And we begin to really wonder, who built the huge constructions at Kutsko and Saksayuaman? Here we get a helping hand from Inca tradition. Legend says that these incredible constructions were already old when they arrived. In other words, the Incas settled on pre-existing sites, which they restored and enlarged. Inca tradition also tells us about the original builder. In ancient days, after a terrible cataclysm, which had reduced men to the levels of beasts, a being came from the south with superhuman powers. He founded a new civilization, teaching the sciences, agriculture and the arts. He taught men to live in harmony, animated by a spirit of altruism, a being accompanied by followers called the Faithful and the Shining. A being who had incredible skills. He could move in the sky and float on water. One of his symbols is lightning, and his name means God of Storms. He had white skin and a beard. His name was Viracocha. A divinity who could move in the sky thousands of years ago, who could fly, a divinity or the survivor of an ancient, highly developed civilization with sophisticated scientific and technological knowledge. This is what the legend implies, and Saksayuaman has other surprises for us. There's a strange construction on the summit of the promontory with its massive walls. It is perfectly round, with three concentric circles intersected by walls radiating out in spokes. The circles are enclosed by another square building connected to the foundations of other square or rectangular buildings. When we checked the orientation of the square building enclosing the circular construction, we found that the corners were perfectly aligned with the cardinal points of the compass, and that the walls intersecting the circles run northeast, southeast, northwest, and southwest. 
ideal orientation for determining the summer and winter solstices. Are these the ruins of an astronomic observatory? Who knows? But the concept of the whole building is extremely advanced. There are very few similar examples in the whole of South America. It is certainly very ancient, older than the Incas. Everything we'd seen at Saxay Yuaman seemed to belong to a remote age. A time we have no human memory of. An age lost in the mists of time. Is this a completely lost story? Perhaps not. Descendants of the Incas still live in the mountains in remote pockets, isolated from white men. Groups which escaped the fury of the conquistadores. Their leaders are wise old men, custodians of ancient knowledge. Some people have talked to them. We were given a place, Samanawazi, and a name, Anton Ponce de Leon. Anton has written various books on his experiences and this ancient knowledge. Inspired by the teaching, he has founded and provided funds for a community where, with the help of his wife, Regia, abandoned children and old people are looked after. The rest home was translated into Samanawazi. An old man explained this knowledge to me in 10 to 15 minutes, using very simple words. But I was a very rational man, and I didn't believe him. I couldn't accept that the truth was so simple. This knowledge is still valid today. It's still relevant, despite the passing of time. And I'm talking about thousands of years. This is an oral tradition which has been handed down, intact. These enormous buildings with their huge stone blocks. Yes, some people say they were built by beings from outer space, but I don't think so. All the buildings in this world were built by human beings, who certainly had very wise teachers. According to what I learned, these teachers came from a continent which disappeared, submerged by the Pacific. It was the biggest continent of all, called Mu, sometimes erroneously called Lemuria. It was a continent called Mu, a word that comes from a very ancient language and means mother country. The Murians, who for us are the third race, were very highly developed physically, psychically and spiritually a level of development we haven't achieved yet. Moving large, heavy objects represented no particular problem for them. These teachers instructed the people of the Andes, our ancestors who built these wonderful constructions. We believe that the Murian civilization which had reached the Andes went out west too, towards Asia. That's why we find the same knowledge all over the world. Is this the answer? Was Mu, a lost civilization we have no memory of, the mother of all known civilizations? According to the wise people of the Andes, this is the key to many mysteries of the past, but we have other clues to follow up. Kenko is a few miles to the east of Saksayu Aman. Its name could hardly be more appropriate, given what we saw. It means intersecting channels. The huge rock, deeply eroded around its base, is carved into a very strange shape at its summit. It's chiseled, carved and molded to create an absurd maze of seemingly random shapes with no apparent meaning. It's incredible. It almost makes you dizzy. What's the meaning of those short staircases, those little platforms, those channels, those balconies? It's a real puzzle, impossible to guess the answer. Did the Incas make it? Was it something to do with their religious functions? That's what we're told, but we don't really know what to think. This disturbing rock puzzle could have been carved 500 years ago, or 5,000 or 50,000, who knows? We'd never seen anything like it. It seemed to have no logic. 
There's a large opening at the base of the massive rock. We go in. Inside is a fairly large cave with a carved rock. It looks like an altar. Later we're told that the Incas used it for their religious ceremonies. This explanation is certainly in keeping with its appearance and that of the other carved rocks in the cave. But the incredible maze, outside, looks much older, designed and created by other hands and other minds. Perhaps the Incas had found these strange ruins and turned them into a temple, believing them sacred. That's one explanation. The style and condition of the stone seem to back it up. The walls and monolith outside look closer to the Inca style. But not quite. We know there's another site, a few miles away, with similar carved rock. We have also found out about a passage which accesses a network of seemingly endless underground tunnels. Many people have ventured in to explore, never to emerge again. It's called the X Zone. Here we get a real surprise. The rock looks like an exact copy of the one at Kenko. The same patterns carved in absurd positions. Stairs that lead to nowhere, completely off center. Why put steps in that position? Were they for walking on or what? On one side, we discover something that looks like a throne, but it's facing a wall of rock. It's crazy. The rocks at Kenko and the Exxon look out of place, almost as if they were once part of the same project which no longer exists. We search for the entrance to the underground tunnels and get a nasty surprise. The local authorities have blocked it up to stop other people wandering in and getting lost. We feel like getting down to work with picks and shovels and opening it up again, but we repress the urge and decide to be patient. The tunnels exist. All we have to do now is find a way in. These enigmatic sites are very puzzling. Their discrepancies are unsettling. We meet someone who has spoken to other wise men, according to him, direct descendants of the survivors of the destruction of Mu. They live in very remote areas in the heart of the Amazon basin, isolated from white people. His name is Ruben Iwaki Hordones. He has Indio blood in his veins and he tells us an amazing story about the origins of the rocks at Kenko and the X zone. Right here, where the city of Cusco is now. In ancient times there was a lake. And under this lake, under its bed, there was an underground temple. About 250 feet underground. The wise ones lived down there. The ancient ones who governed the continent wisely. And the entrance to this place was on a hill. The same hill that's called Saksai Waman today. That's where the entrance was. After 10,000 years, there was a cataclysm on the planet. It destroyed the temple, and the lake above it flooded. This cataclysm wasn't an earthquake. It was much more. There were volcanic eruptions. Here, too. Here, where the temple was, there was a volcanic eruption. A terrible explosion. In Saksai Waman, there's an area where the lava has solidified. But that explosion produced fragments of exploding rock too. Burning pieces of rock. The force of the explosion shattered the rooms of the temple and fragments were thrown into the air and fell here, there and everywhere. There's one that nowadays is called Kenko. The Incas found it like that. They found these wonderful constructions and they used them for their religious ceremonies because they realized how important they were. They knew where they came from. 
There are other fragments as big as this room in an area near the solidified lava. There you can see upside down staircases. Well, these fragments came up from underground when the disaster happened. And they fell. They fell haphazardly. Upside down. And this shows that they were part of what was underground. Once again, ancient traditions insist on the existence of once great civilizations which have now disappeared, and Cuzco still has some mysteries in store for us. The most sacred and important temple in the whole of the Inca Empire was at Cuzco. It was dedicated to Viracocha, and it was called Coricancha, or the Golden Enclosure the Spanish-built Santo Domingo Cathedral on its ruins. But the ancient walls can still be seen both from inside and outside the Latter-day Colonial Church. The walls are still imposing and very cleverly crafted. But the stones themselves are much smaller than in the other structures we had visited. More a building that Inca architects might have designed. There are tunnels under the church. A story tells of how some boys got lost in them in 1920. After a whole week, only one of them re-emerged, injured and confused. He died soon afterwards, clutching a solid gold cob of corn. There are no written records to confirm the story, but the people of Cuzco assure us it's true. We managed to get permission to visit the digs made by other researchers who had been trying to unravel the puzzle of the mysterious tunnels and climb down under the church. We followed the tunnel for a while, but are brought up short. The tunnel is blocked. Later, we're told that the excavations were stopped because of the risk of undermining the foundations of the church above. We wonder whether the Coracancha tunnels led to a more impressive network of underground tunnels, perhaps those that connected Cuzco, Sacsayhuaman, and other places even further away. But we'll have to wait for answers to these questions. The fact is, the tunnels exist, and their existence is backed up by ancient traditions. Traditionally, the tunnels are supposed to have gone from Cusco towards Quito in Ecuador. And from the south, they went towards what is today Bolivia, towards Chile, towards the forest, towards Brazil. They went everywhere. Unfortunately, some of them were blocked up for safety reasons when they were discovered. So, nowadays, it's very difficult to find the entrances. I know, I'm sure, that they exist. I saw some of them with my father when I was a child. And I know that there are tunnels under the Catholic churches. We discover that another church in Cuzco has tunnels, the Church of the Jesuits. It was built in 1576 on the foundations of the Amarucancha, the royal palace of the Inca ruler Uwayacapac. When the Spanish arrived, Uwayacapac's two sons, Uasca and Atahualpa, were waging a civil war for control of the empire. This helped the Spanish conquer the Inca kingdom. The church houses some important works of art. One of the most important pieces is the altar carved in cedar wood and covered in gold. It was by the Italian sculptor Bernardo Vitti. After long talks, we managed to get permission to explore underground this church too. There's a small, beautifully decorated chapel under the altar. This is where the trapdoor that accesses the tunnels is. 
The heavy cover hasn't been lifted for a long time. We're very excited as we get ready. This is the first time cameras have been allowed to film the tunnels. The entrance is small and difficult to get into. Once we manage to climb down, we get a disappointment. The tunnels are blocked after only a few meters. The ecclesiastical authorities ordered them to be blocked for security reasons. The tunnels run under the city and in the past have been used by thieves as a way into the church. But once more they confirmed that the Inca's sacred places were connected by a network of tunnels. Did the Incas build them? Ancient tradition believes not and we find echoes in the chronicles of the conquistadores themselves. In 1571, Juan Polo de Ondegardo wrote, The city of Cuzco was the home and residence of the gods. Every fountain, well and wall concealed a mystery. We leave Cuzco on the trail of more Peruvian mysteries. The fortress of Ayantaytambo dominates the valley of Urubamba, clinging to a hill about 300 feet high. It was the Inca's main fortification to defend the sacred valley. It was here that Pizarro experienced one of his few defeats during his campaign to conquer the huge empire of the sun. Characterized by its terraces used for farming, the settlement developed up to the summit of the hill. It was an important military, religious and agricultural center about 60 miles to the northwest of Cuzco. About two-thirds of the way up the steep steps that lead to the top of the hill, the familiar walls appear with their usual astonishing craftsmanship. Extremely large, heavy, skillfully worked polygonal stones fitting perfectly together with no mortar or any other type of cement. Again, we wonder, is this Inca work? The archaeologists say it is, but on one wall we find a stretch that has been repaired. It must have been done by the Incas. But strangely, the repair work has been carried out using much smaller stones, and the level of craftsmanship is much rougher. Why? Perhaps the Inca architects had forgotten their once sophisticated techniques. Or were the original builders not Incas? That seems to be the most likely answer. There are a row of ten trapezoidal niches on the wall of the terrace where the main entrance once was. The joins are incredible with absurd angles. They look almost ironical. Did they have a practical purpose, or were they just showing off the craftsmanship of the builders? As we climb higher, the walls still show the same level of incredible workmanship as the ones we've just seen. On top of the hill, we find the ruins of the houses which once belonged to the Inca priests and nobles while the populace lived in houses further down. There are other remains on the slopes of the hill in front. Archaeologists say that they were once grain storage warehouses. But although they are very interesting, our attention is attracted by something else. On the top of the hill, a series of huge red porphyry monoliths form a mad puzzle, lying scattered around on the ground in no apparent order, some of them weighing dozens of tons. Some are accurately carved, others are obviously unfinished. An amazing structure rears up out of this chaotic scene. Six enormous monoliths perfectly aligned along a southeasterly vector 
and perhaps uniquely, separated by spaces in the same stone, a unique example of craftsmanship. Red porphyry is a very hard stone, as heavy as granite. The monoliths are about 13 feet high, 6.5 feet wide, and 3 to 6 feet thick. They weigh from 25 to 50 tons. They were quarried from a nearby mountain, so obviously they were cut from the rock face, taken down into the valley, and then dragged 328 feet up to their destination. How? Archaeologists mention thousands of workers, ropes, tree trunks and potatoes used as lubricant to help the massive monolith slide. That's right, potatoes. The structure is obviously incomplete, as the blocks scattered haphazardly around the summit confirm, but nobody knows what its intended use was or why it was never finished. Another enigma puzzles us in the midst of so many mysteries, a symbol carved on one of the monoliths. A pyramid rising in steps, the same symbol also found in Egypt. Is it just a coincidence? The Incas certainly had no knowledge of the Egyptians, but could both civilizations have been inspired by the same matrix? In his book, Operation Fawcett, the legendary explorer Colonel Percy Fawcett wrote, the Incas inherited their fortresses and cities from an earlier civilization, and Garcilaso de la Vega in his chronicles tells us how they had been erected in the first age before the Incas. The first age? What does it mean? Was it the age when the gods could fly? The age when the survivors of an ancient, highly developed civilization settled in Peru? We have evidence of this because here in Peru we've studied the pre-Inca cultures. 10,000 years ago there was the Chimu civilization, which means those from Mu. Further south, there was the Muchik civilization, sometimes called Muchika, but the correct name is Muchik, or descendants of Mu, coming from Mu. We leave from the little station at Ollantaytambo, the train wends its slow way next to the river through the Urubamba Valley, the sacred valley of the Incas. The countryside is interesting, harsh and wild. It gets greener the further we go. Finally, we arrive in Machu Picchu, sacred myth of the past and present. We get off at the station in Aguas Calientes. This little town is at the foot of the mountain where the lost city of the Incas is sited. It has grown rapidly in a chaotic fashion, thanks to the influx of tourists from all over the world. We shoulder the equipment we need to film and set off towards the archaeological site. The road we take is the steepest. It leads to one of the highest points which dominate the city. The climb is tiring. We still haven't got acclimatized to the altitude here. But the magic of the place has already enthralled us. We're impatient. We can't wait to see the legendary monuments of one of the most fascinating cities of the ancient world. Machu Picchu, the lost city of the Incas, emerged from the mists of time in 1911. The American explorer Hiram Bingham, professor at Yale University, is the author of the discovery. As a matter of fact, the Peruvian archaeologist Agustin Lizarraga had discovered the ruins before him in 1902, and two families of campesinos were found living there, farming the ancient terraces left by the Incas. Bingham had the merit of studying the site scientifically and telling the world about this amazing urban structure. Without taking any merit away from Bingham, he was the one who made Machu Picchu world famous, but it was the Peruvians who guided him to Machu Picchu. 
That's important to remember. There were people here before, and people came to Machu Picchu from Cusco many years before Mr. Bingham. When was it built? What was it for? Was it a fortified settlement? A refuge for the noble Inca class, or a city dedicated to the cult of the gods? There are many theories, but no sure answers. Yet the stones speak. Machu Picchu is a silent voice with many tales to tell if you listen carefully. Machu Picchu, a saga in stone at 7,800 feet above sea level, is perfectly integrated with its surroundings. So much so that it looks almost like a natural feature rather than a man-made construction. The logic behind so many great works. The sacred rock reproduces the profile of the nearby mountain. In a fantastic play of light and shadows, the profile of an Indios emerges from the shape of the mountains against the skyline. An incredible coincidence. In the Condor Temple, sculpted and natural elements blend to bring the sacred animal to life. Its wings of stone capture a moment of flight for all eternity. The Water Temple. Water, another sacred element for the Incas. The mysterious mortar room. It's in what is known as the industrial area. The Incas were believed to have dyed material in the two rocks shaped like mortars. Material they then dried in the cylinders protruding from the walls. But is this the right explanation? Magical Machu Picchu, scattered fragments from a lost arcane world. The houses of the ordinary people were near the agricultural sector, with its barns and characteristic terraces. The houses are stone-built, small and simple. Once through the main gates of the city, the path winds through some narrow streets and then leads to a strangely shaped building. Bingham called it the Torion, or Tower. Today it's known as the Temple of the Sun. It's built to a semicircular plan with two trapezoidal windows set in the curved wall. One faces north and the other faces east. They can be used to determine the summer and winter solstices. There is a niche with structures carved into the lower part of the building. Its purpose was to determine important astronomic events. The Torion is more than a temple. It's an astronomic calendar in stone and it's not the only one in Machu Picchu. The temple with the three windows is in the middle level of the city and the alignment of the openings enables the equinoxes to be calculated. The same as the monolithic stones of Stonehenge in England. Stone is the great protagonist of the ancient world. But on a higher level, behind a three-walled building reached by a flight of roughly hewn steps, we find an even more sophisticated astronomic structure. The Intihuatana is a polygonal structure cut into the living rock. The precision is extraordinary. A spur of rock like a cog on the upper surface is perfectly aligned to the northeast-southeast. An accurate sundial for calculating the solstices and the equinoxes. Machu Picchu is incredible. It's more like a huge stone computer for astronomical calculus rather than a city. It's true that here at Machu Picchu there are important sectors both on the lower and higher levels. The actual position of the city, it was placed in the best position to receive solar energy. That's very clear in Machu Picchu. You can see both the sunrise and the sunset. It's positioned to receive as much solar energy as possible all year round. Could the Inca Empire have developed such sophisticated knowledge? These are precise technical instruments not simple ritual symbols. They're backed up by precise geometrical calculations, mathematics and astronomy. Only a civilization that developed over a long period of time could have produced anything like them. Machu Picchu means the old mountain, but how old actually is it? According to the archaeologists, the city was built in the 15th century. But in 1930, 
Professor Rolf Müller from the University of Potsdam in Germany studied the astronomic alignments of the Torion, the temple with the three windows, and the Intihuatana, and established that they had been built sometime between 4000 and 2000 BC. These incredible dates were confirmed by further studies carried out by the astronomers Deborn and White from Arizona University. Does this mean that here, as in other sites, the Incas settled on pre-existing structures? The dates calculated by the astronomers confirm this theory. Local oral traditions that have been handed down to the present day also tell of ancient gods who initiated civilization and built wonderful cities, gods who could fly, perhaps the survivors of the highly developed civilization of Mu. On the sacred square of Machu Picchu, the Temple of the Three Windows, the main temple and the other structures are all built from perfectly fitted together polygonal blocks. The by now familiar joints, already seen in Cuzco and Saksai Yuaman. We find similar differences in other parts of the city. The difference in style and technique used to build Machu Picchu are glaringly obvious. Carefully crafted monoliths make up the older part and rougher workmanship on the later parts. Once more, we find different styles and levels of technical ability. Were they built by different people? How else can we explain the difference? But we have other mysteries to unravel. We want to know if there were any underground tunnels at Machu Picchu. And are told that when maintenance work was being done on the sacred square, where the main temple is, the workmen heard echoes as if the ground below was hollow. Some digging was done but only to a depth of a few feet, without finding anything. Perhaps the cavities are further down. A guide who heard about our research said that there were some tunnels in another area. He offers to take us there. After a difficult scramble, we come to the narrow entrance. The young guide climbs down first. It's a tight squeeze. Even passing the equipment we need to explore and film is difficult. We can't really take all we need, but we decide to make do. Once we're in, walking isn't easy. The tunnel is very irregular. It seems as if it had only been started and not completed. It's very damp, and the ground underfoot is very slippery, so we have to be careful. After a certain distance, the tunnel is blocked, and we can't go any further. Getting back is even more difficult, but we have the proof that someone had created underground tunnels at Machu Picchu too. The sun is setting as we emerge from the narrow tunnel. The ancient city is hauntingly beautiful and had shared some of its secrets with us. Our minds are echoing with the words of Colonel Fawcett. The Indios tribes inherited the traditions of a great civilization. Perhaps they were the ancestors of the Incas, perhaps a mysterious race who left behind the gigantic remains that the invading Incas later incorporated into their own buildings. Historical civilizations all have a common matrix, albeit a forgotten one. Even Colonel Fawcett was convinced of the truth of this. The huge ruins scattered around Peru and other countries around the world are an obvious clue confirmed by their identical construction technique. The myths and traditions of many ancient people have handed down the memory of this civilization. There are mysterious tunnels at these ancient sites. Perhaps these clues are still not enough to prove the existence of a lost civilization which gave rise to all successive civilizations. There is still a lot to discover and the research goes on. In 
Peru, there are ancient buildings which defy modern technology. How could inhabitants of ancient Peru build these wonders without having any modern know-how? They did provide an answer. They believed the gods transmitted their knowledge. The heritage of an evolved civilization with an extraordinary technology, today forgotten. More than a century has passed since the first finding, but the gusty winds of the Paracas Peninsula, about 250 kilometers south of Lima, have not removed traces of the giant drawing carved in the sand. It is called the Paracas Trident or Candelabrum. It seems that it was created by the Paracas culture, who inhabited this region between 300 BC and 200 AD. But this is just conjecture. In fact, the few stories which do mention it don't reveal the authors, and neither do they indicate its date of creation. No analyses are available to date a simple excavation in the sand, and no organic finds nearby were unearthed, like clothing, tools, or other finds, crucial for carbon-14 dating, which are normally associated with a place to define a more or less accurate date. Even its significance is uncertain. It was conjectured that it could be a sign pointing towards areas of the ancient empire like Cusco, Machu Picchu or Nazca. But when checked, it appeared that its central axis extends and ends directly in the Pacific Ocean. Others have conjectured that it could be a religious symbol, perhaps the Tree of Life or the representation on Earth of a constellation, perhaps the Southern Cross. In any case, the almost 200 meters of the central vertical axis, the nearly 120 meters of the horizontal axis, and the 40 degree inclination seem devised to make it visible from a great distance. A signal, therefore, a sort of lighthouse, Arriving from the sea, in fact, it starts to be seen even more than 15 kilometers from the coastline. But arriving from the sky, it can be seen even sooner. According to research by Professor Zekaria Sitchin, one of the world's greatest scholars on Sumerian cuneiform writing and an expert on ancient civilizations, the symbol represents Viracocha and marks the point where the areas visited by the ancient gods start. A higher entity, the head of a population who could glide over water and fly, worshipped with different names throughout Central and Southern America, who had restored civilization after the Great Flood. Viracocha, however, did not resemble the people who inhabited the continent at the time. He did not have dark skin and wasn't clean-shaven but was rather white-skinned and had a beard. Could he have been the survivor of an ancient, evolved civilization, today forgotten, who had escaped a worldwide catastrophe? The head of a small group with a technology not understood by those ancient populations? The ancient Paracas population lived around the Candelabrum area and were simple and peaceful people. They survived on fishing and rudimentary agriculture. They were skilled weavers and created beautiful painted ceramic ware. This lifestyle, however, is in sharp contrast to the practice they are mostly known for, drilling and deforming skulls. 
deforming was achieved by wrapping the head of newborns with bandages or wooden boards, which compressed the bones of the skull to make them grow abnormally. This custom must have caused much pain. Nevertheless, it was practiced for an extremely long time, and it also spread to more distant lands like Egypt, Malta, and Central America. Ancient deformed skulls dating back more than 6,000 years were found in these areas. Today, the true reason behind this custom has yet to be discovered. Aesthetic reasons do not seem to justify its use, and the fact that it spread to civilizations which had no direct contact renders its expansion even more unfathomable. Other populations too practice deformities which today are considered abhorrent, like the Mayan custom to induce strabismus or the Chinese to deform women's feet. But these habits have remained confined to those cultures without spreading to other populations like skull deformation has. This deformity was also considered a distinctive sign and performed only within the highest ranks. The Viracocha representations which have come down to us depict a being with a stocky bust, short legs and especially big head. Could it be that deforming skulls was a way to resemble the gods? Ica is a town south of Lima. Its small museum holds an unsolved archaeological mystery. Dr. Javier Cabrera d'Arquea was a doctor in the small town of Ica, loved and respected by the people all the more because he was a descendant of the city founders. He progressively transformed his doctor's surgery into a museum. Today, the three rooms hosting the museum hold about 11,000 stones, which weigh from a few grams to 500 kilos. These are carbonized andesites of volcanic origin and date back to the Mesozoic era. There are several incisions on their surface. The story starts in 1966, when a friend gave Cabrera a stone with the drawing of a prehistoric animal engraved. He discovered that it had been found next to the Okukanje Desert and that there were many more. The stones had also generated some trading. In fact, the farmers would collect the stones and sell them to tourists as souvenirs. They told him that the stones had been brought to light in 1960 after the flooding of the Rio Ica. Cabrera was thunderstruck. Thereafter, the Peruvian doctor started to collect and study these stones with passion, a mission he pursued until his death in 2001. As he continued in his research, the doctor was increasingly convinced that the drawings carved on the stones were not just simple artistic creations, but some sort of ideographic writing. The images, in fact, were subdivided by Cabrera into subjects and illustrate the complex knowledge of more or less familiar subjects like astronomy and geography, but also more unusual, like surgery. The stones can therefore be rightfully considered as pages of a vast library. Their surfaces depict representations of body parts, heart transplants, maps of the entire planet which reveal how continents were millions of years ago, astronomers who study the passage of heavenly bodies, Wagons drawn by horses, kangaroos, men with dinosaurs. But if dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago, and it is thought that man's appearance on Earth only dates back a few million years ago, how can it be that they are depicted together on these stones? It is difficult to imagine that this civilization had reached the degree of knowledge represented in these scenes during such a distant era. Anatomy, in fact, was only born in the 1400s, while 
The first heart transplant only dates back to 1967. The knowledge that the Earth is round only goes back a few centuries BC. And the use of the telescope for astronomic studies is owed to Galileo Galilei in the 1600s. Horses became extinct thousands of years before they were reintroduced by the Spanish to the Americas in the 1500s. And the ancient inhabitants of Peru never used the wheel. While the pre-Columbian populations certainly did not know what kangaroos were. Are we faced with the greatest archaeological discovery of our times or with a resounding fraud? Various archaeologists believe these are counterfeits, mainly created by a couple of campesinos to sell them to tourists. And this theory needs to take into account the following data. It is estimated that between the Cabrera finds, those owned by Peruvian collectors and those taken abroad, the amount of carved stones amounts to over 50,000 pieces. Now, that's an enormous amount, even for a tireless couple of forgers. In addition, many stones weigh several hundred kilograms. Why create such cumbersome souvenirs so hard to sell? And it is really hard to believe that two campesinos, barely able to read and write, could ever have acquired the scientific knowledge carved on the stones. The reporter Juan de Santa Cruz Pachacuti Yanqui, in an article of the 1500s, reports that the Incas would call them manco stones, meaning power stones. And these were part of the funerary vestiges of noble families based on an ancient tradition. This is confirmed by the fact that in August 1966, several samples were found in pre-Incaic tombs by the president of Lima's Polytechnic Institute, Mr. Santiago Agurto Calvo, and by the archaeologist Alejandro Pezzia of the National Institute of Archaeology in Peru. The news appeared in December of the same year in the scientific supplement of a Lima daily newspaper. But the most sensational scientific fact derives from the lab analysis on the stones. Cabrera had them analyzed by the mining engineering company Mauricio Oshield and by the Mineralogy and Petrography Institute of Bonn University in Germany. Based on the oxidation layer, which covers the engravings, it seems that the stones were engraved at least 12,000 years ago. The Lima Aeronautic Museum, which owns about 60 samples, had the analysis repeated and the data were confirmed. The engravings are at least 12,000 years old. Obviously, these are not the millions of years which can be surmised from the scenes with men and dinosaurs living together. Yet even 12,000 years ago, dinosaurs were already extinct and we know of no civilizations of the time which had such advanced knowledge. According to Cabrera, this culture, which he called Glyptolic Civilization, disappeared due to a planet catastrophe caused by the wrong use of their own technology. Could they perhaps be survivors who created their engravings to hand down their knowledge and history to generations to come? It is also true that farmers can realize imitations, and there are many, but these are easy to unmask with tests. That's why the Ica stones remain an archaeological mystery with their fantastic representations. Brain transplants. Pyramid systems to transform solar energy and distribute it for use. Flying machines resembling strange mechanical birds. But human flight is one of the greatest breakthroughs of the modern age. Only some time ago, it was believed an impossible feat. And the use of the sun as a source of energy is also a recent victory. Who is this unknown population which emerges from the chasm of time with this sophisticated knowledge? The aspect of Glyptolic men incredibly resembles the Viracocha depictions, especially the one found on the door of the sun in Tiahuanaco, on the shores of the Titicaca Lake in Bolivia. In fact, there's a man with stumpy legs, large belly and large head, 
out of proportion to his body. The same physical makeup of the glyptolic men. After all, Ica is next to the Candelabrum area inhabited by the Paracas and in order to best underline their affiliation to the noble classes, they would deform skulls. Perhaps to resemble the ancient Viracochas? The Paracas also perforated skulls and on the Ica stones, the Glyptolic men are depicted performing brain surgery. And yet, on the Paracas Peninsula, there's the Candelabrum, which, according to Zechariah Sitchin, indicates the beginning of the areas where Viracocha had lived with his group. And Ica is also next to the Nazca Plain, where there are large drawings only visible from the sky. Drawings which we find engraved in the Ica stones. Is this only a casual coincidence? Perhaps the Nazca Plain could add other elements to this research. The Pan American Sur cuts through the vast Nazca Desert Plain with its drawings, which have engaged researchers from around the world in the attempt to explain the mystery, like a dark gash. The stretch between kilometer 419 and 465 passes right in the middle of the mysterious drawings, but from land, it is impossible to understand their true aspect. At first, only stones are visible, furrows which are not that deep, and clear spaces with different colors and undefined shapes. From the tower, 14 meters high, visibility improves only a little, yet over 200 drawings and almost 13,000 geometric figures are spread over its entire expansion. Only from above is it possible to realize the true essence of the shapes traced on the ground. The Nazca Plain is one of the planet's driest and most inhospitable. In fact, rainfall only amounts to one cubic centimeter per year, more or less a quarter of an hour of rain over a 12-month span. A real hellish, barren and stony land but at the same time, the ideal place to trace images which can remain unchanged throughout the centuries. These lands are quite unique. After penetrating the pampas and walking over them, you realize that even in 100 years' time, the same tracks will still be here because they are formed by a layer of ferrous stones which reflect the heat during the day, forming a vortex of hot air which does not allow sand to deposit but moves it to the side. These stones are superficial, brown, and if trodden upon, you find that the white earth emerges, thus remaining permanently exposed. That's why these lines have kept visible all these centuries. An ideal land to preserve the geometric figures in time, but it doesn't explain how the ancient inhabitants of the area, the Nazca, could draw them and trace kilometric lines, most of which are only visible from the sky. Many drawings can easily be observed from the hilltops or mountains which surround the desert. Others, definitely big, cannot be seen from these heights. It is extremely hard, and since they can be observed as a whole only from above, the question is, how have they been created? We don't know. It's a mystery. Hence, as Professor Adzabake claims, in order to have an overview of the larger drawings and direct the creative work, an overview was necessary and achievable only from the height of a sufficiently high hill. But on the plain, there aren't any. Therefore, that only leaves flight. But who had the capacity to fly over this plain centuries ago? The oral tradition of the Nazca speaks clearly. The Viracochas. The figures have been drawn with an accuracy which has baffled researchers who have examined them. 
the zoomorphic drawings have been traced with one continuous line, meaning with a technique which is even more difficult in terms of lines and geometries. One would think these are more recent, as they are more sophisticated, but on the contrary, they are more ancient. Therefore, the logic which states that human progress grows in time fails with the regression of technical capacity. How can this be explained? Perhaps the inhabitants of the plain ran out of crucial technical support. Oral tradition helps by reporting that suddenly the Viracochas left for an unknown destination. Could this be the right explanation? When they left, the Nazca found it impossible to trace other zoomorphic figures. So, they were limited to continue drawing easier lines and geometric figures. Only in modern times did man understand what had been drawn in the Nazca Plain. An era when man had realized his ancient dream to fly. The first to discover the true nature of the inexplicable furrows traced on the ground was the American geographer Paul Kosok in 1939, while he flew over the area with light aircraft. He tried to discover the mystery, guessing it was an astronomic calendar. But the most famous researcher who tried to unveil the mystery behind these lines was Maria Reiche, a German. The scholar, affectionately called the Lady of the Pampas, also fought hard to safeguard this extraordinary site, managing to have it proclaimed Patrimony of Humanity by UNESCO. In the city of Nazca, an association and a museum have been named after her. Her grave is in the garden of the museum. It was an order by Mary to bury her body in a tomb which we keep in this museum. She wanted to be part of this area, feel surrounded and safeguarded by these lines and drawings. Reiche dedicated her life to studying the drawings of the plain, starting in 1949, a passion which kept her going till the very end, in 1998, the year she died. Her conjecture is amongst those most highly esteemed. There are many conjectures. But the most widely embraced is that by German doctor Maria Reich, who claims it is a large astronomic calendar used for agriculture. Victoria Nikitsky lives in the town of Nazca and knew Reich during the last years of her life when the scholar had become blind and paralyzed in her bed. She writes promotional material on the drawings in the Nazca Plain and illustrates to tourists the wonderful work carried out by Maria Reiche by means of a simple plastic model. The spider and the monkey are directly linked to the Big Dipper constellation in the case of the monkey and to the Orion constellation in the case of the spider. Both are connected to the summer solstice. This was how it was possible to forecast rainfalls. A huge astronomic calendar. Is this the answer? But was such complexity really necessary only to achieve an astronomic calendar which, amongst other things, could be realized in a less colossal and laborious size? An astronomic calendar for agricultural use also surely had to be completed quickly for survival. But archaeologists speak of 1,500 years for its creation. In addition, why realize such a mammoth work which could only be seen from the sky in flight? Without this capacity, the great majority of signs traced on the ground becomes inexplicable and therefore useless. Finally, many drawings, if subjected to computer inspections, find no astronomical reference whatsoever. 
Therefore, Reich's studies only partially unveil the Pampas mystery. And the enigmatic figure traced on the side of a small hill seems to look and salute someone in flight. But who flew in the distant past? A plot which thickens even more over the past few years with the discovery of other drawings and geometric figures in the close by Palpa Plain. The style is similar to the Nazca, but these date further back in time and are still only comprehensible from above in flight. Finally, the Nazca and Palpa drawings cover a total area of nearly 600 square kilometers and, to be created, thousands of tons of stones were shifted. Only a very important reason could justify any activity of this magnitude. The Antonini Educational Museum is in the town of Nazca, where many archaeological finds of the Nazca culture are kept. The last to have inhabited this land before the Incas, who incorporated them into their empire, cancelling out all their customs and traditions. The Nazca had reached an incredible artistic and cultural level, witnessed by the exquisitely painted ceramic ware and by the sophisticated and efficient underground aqueduct system they had built. There are no elements in these finds which help clarify the mystery of the origins and the significance of the drawings of the plain. Except for one engraved stone found in the Nazca tomb. The workmanship is not as accurate as that of the Ica stones and the drawings depict elements ascribable to the daily Nazca world. But why would the Nazca engrave stones when they were perfectly capable of painting exquisitely colourful ceramic ware and weaving finely embroidered blankets. Perhaps it was a way of responding to what they had seen in finds they believed to be of great importance, like the Ica stones. Once again, the engraved stones, which were considered stones of power, reappear. Or were they perhaps even stones of knowledge? Is there a true connection between the Ica and the Nazca? A 1586 report, written by Magistrate Louis de Monzon, explained what the Plains natives said about the origins of the drawings. During extremely ancient times, a small group of people called Viracochas, who differed from the Indios, reached this land, and the Indios obeyed them, followed them, and realized roads which can still be seen today. The Viracochas suddenly left, but promised to return. A memory and a promise which was kept so alive in those people to deceive the Incas and Aztecs when they met the conquistadores for the first time. The Spanish were exchanged for the gods who had returned, thus allowing a handful of men to defeat well-trained and much more powerful armies. But, truthfully, who were the Viracochas? A myth? A legend? or a historical truth? Were they the true inspirers of the great civilizations of the past? Could the gods be the survivors of a remote and forgotten civilization which had reached a level of progress equal to or higher than the current one? The Monzon Chronicle and the engraved stone exhibited at the Antonini Museum add a new important detail to the other clues and the ancient oral traditions seem increasingly less of a myth, of a legend, to become history. The Marcawazi Meseta lies on top of a 4,200 metre mountain, 80 kilometres northeast of Lima. It is little known still today, also because in order to reach it, one has to organise a true expedition rather than a small trip. In fact, the final section of the road to reach San Pedro de Casta, the last inhabited centre of the Meseta Valley, is a mule track which clambers up the sides of the mountain for about 30 kilometres, large enough for a car to pass. 
driving along the road at night without a guide who knows the place is an even more difficult task. In fact, a five-hour trip is required to reach the small Pueblo, 3,200 meters up. Mass tourism, with its comforts, has not yet spoilt the primitive territory surrounding the plateau. Marcauazi was discovered by the Peruvian archaeologist Daniel Ruso de los Eros in the 50s. His research convinced him that there were some entrances to the mythical network of underground tunnels which crossed South America and the ruins of sculptures realized in a distant era by an unknown and extremely evolved population which he called Masma. Could it be another trace of the passage of the mythical Viracochas? In the small San Pedro de Casta Museum, there are many Meseta finds discovered by Ruzo. They come from a settlement of Incas who lived in Marcauazi long before the disappearance of the mysterious Masma culture. Amongst the various types of finds, the mummies, with their facial expressions, paralyzed in a moment of eternal terror. Perhaps they are the vestiges of Inca prisoners tortured during the Spanish conquest. But this is not a certainty. The unpaved small square of San Pedro is from where visitors to the plateau usually depart. The path leading to Marcauazi is even more difficult than the one departing from the valley. It can only be covered by foot or with pack animals, which become even more indispensable when heavy, cumbersome luggage needs to be transported to the Meseta at an altitude of 4,000 meters. From one of the highest points, the first ruins of the ancient Inca settlement can be seen, while further on, there are even more. The Meseta, in fact, takes its name from these ruins, one of the few Inca constructions to be built on two inhabitable floors, and the name Marcauazi means exactly home with two floors. Daniel Ruzo de los Eros has studied the ruins of the Meseta for eight years in a row, stationing at the plateau for six months a year. The small hut where the archaeologist would camp is still in an excellent state and an obliged stopover for anyone visiting Marcauazi. Manuel Olivares is an expert guide who knows the Meseta inside out. He accompanied Ruzo during the last years when the archaeologists studied the Marcauazi sculptures and cavities. Even today, Don Manuel acts as a guide to the very few tourists and researchers who adventure to the Meseta. In 1952, Daniel Ruzzo came here for the very first time and we climbed to Marcauazi. I worked with him for eight years, six months a year. He would work a week in Lima and the other week in Marcauazi. This was his job during those years. Don Manuel still accompanies visitors to the Meseta to settle into their campsite, a natural amphitheater sheltered from the winds which blow over the plateau. From here, in order to reach a canal which Ruzzo believed communicated with the mythical network of underground tunnels, connecting places hundreds of kilometers afar, at least an hour's walk is needed. The place is called Infernillo, meaning Little Hell, and the name exactly sums up what the natives think of this tunnel. The entrance to the canal is about seven meters underground, and it can be reached by crossing a cleft between two gigantic rocks. When Ruzzo used to work here, Manuel did lower himself down various meters, 
but the archaeologist feared for his safety and prevented him from continuing the descent. To reach the entrance, it is important to have mountain gear. Unfortunately, the heavy rainfalls which have hit the Meseta have brought mud and silt which now block the entrance. To open it, suitable excavation equipment would be required with long working days. But the tunnels are not the only Markawazi enigma. The plateau is also the showcase of dozens of mysterious drawings found and catalogued by Ruzzo. The archaeologist claimed that the technique used by the Mazma to carve the Markawazi rocks differs from any known to mankind. He defined it organic sculpture and believed it derived from extremely advanced knowledge from a different way of viewing reality and representing shapes. A world where magical power and the earth and sky bond were of fundamental importance. About 32 drawings can be found in Makawazi. And each one of these only piques the curiosity to discover how it was possible to realize them. In my personal opinion, it seems obvious that these were extremely well-prepared people with another type of mentality, a very special civilization with great knowledge. Ruzzo discovered that in order to recognize the drawings carved in the rock, they should be viewed from the right distance and angle, under precise light and shade conditions, at the right time of day and even right season of the year. Lacking these prerequisites, the sculptures are indecipherable. This rock was called the African Lion by the scholar, and one can guess the profile only when looking from a certain perspective, exactly as explained by Ruzzo. If viewed from other angles, it shows no comprehensible shape. Identifying the sculptures is made even more difficult by natural erosion due to the enormous amount of time passed since their creation. The period surmised by Ruzzo dates back much further than the commonly accepted time, to extremely ancient eras over 10,000 years ago. An age which would have certainly transformed tools or handiwork left by the mysterious sculptors to dust, making any test currently available to date the drawings practically useless. This is Markawazi, and this is the monument for humanity. We have come here so that you can learn about it and the other drawings which are here. The most famous work at Markawazi is the Monument for Humanity. Ruzzo had come up with this name, but its existence was already known by the indigenous population for a long time, and they called it the Head of the Inca. It is 25 meters tall and is very eroded, but the profile is clearly human. Ruzzo discovered that by glancing at it from different angles and light conditions, other faces of various sizes belonging to all human races appeared on its surface. That's how it gained its current name, Monumento a la Humanidad. Other drawings can be seen from the plateau. Some are clearly identifiable. Others are hidden in the mysterious landscape of the Meseta, awaiting the ideal conditions to unveil themselves to the eyes of observers. But many archaeologists did not agree on the artificial origin of the sculptures. They claimed that they were created by natural erosion and weather conditions. 
fully convinced of his discovery, Ruzzo invited important researchers to visit and study the sculptures and data he had collected. The German, Albert Glesicke, the Frenchman, Marcel Homme, the Austrian archaeologist, Hans Schindler Bellamy, and the Englishman, Peter Allen, all agreed with the theories supported by Ruzzo. Allen personally visited the Marcawazi sculptures and was so impressed, he said, the fact that they have this peculiarity implies an uncommon technique. Once more, the science world was divided into two opposite stands. Who was right? And once more, the usual question arose. Did the people who inhabited the Meseta in ancient times remember the origin of the finds in a place the Incas considered sacred? Pedro Cieza de Leon, Spanish reporter with the Conquistadores, asked them if they knew who had created the strange shapes which were on the plateau. They replied that they belonged to men who came from afar, white-skinned foreigners with a beard. Imposing ruins of Chavin de Huantar are 3,200 meters high, lying between the mountains of southern Peru. They have been attributed to the Chavin culture, one of the most important in ancient Peru, considered the cultural root of the subsequent Andean civilizations. This culture developed suddenly in 1200 BC, and its influence spread to coastlines far from Peru. The entire complex of buildings is set towards east-west, amongst which the large temple which overlooks the entire site. It is called El Castillo and is built with various sized stone blocks with a more or less regular weight and shape. The walls were covered with large stone slabs, sometimes carved in the characteristic Chavin style. Similar carvings can be seen on the columns of the temple portal. And on several stone slabs of the ancient round square. The walls of the Castillo were adorned with over 200 stone heads, called hollow heads. Currently, only one has remained fixed in place. The others have been transferred to the small Chavin Museum. Yes, here in the exhibition hall we have heads with proud faces, astonished faces. Research claims that these hollow heads show people who were in a trance state, in a hallucinatory state. These expressions would terrify the visitor who came to this area. The hollow heads were stuck, fixed to the walls of the main Chavin temple. The Chavin population worshipped the Jaguar god, and its religion originated from the atavic bond between man and the forest. A religion which, as the museum's director explains, terrified its believers with practices which probably utilized hallucinogenic substances. It seems strange, however, that a population with such a primitive religion had the knowledge to build the imposing Chavin structures. Could it be, perhaps, that the Chavin people had simply occupied pre-existing structures, built by a population which had disappeared and had more advanced knowledge. The Castillo is also called Old Temple, but by looking carefully at it, rather than a temple, it looks like a giant strongbox. Its massive walls, in fact, do not have any windows, and inside there are no large worship halls. Underground, 
one of the galleries leads to a small, cross-shaped room where the most valuable and sacred Chavin work stands out. A granite monolith, four and a half meters high, with a monstrous carved anthropomorphic figure revealing animal features. The style is typical of the Chavin population and represents the highest divinity of that ancient culture, the Jaguar God. The monolith is called El Lanzon, the spear, and neither the passageway leading to it nor the narrow hall where it is placed were suitable to hold large worshipping crowds. But from a religious point of view, there is no sense in this. Usually, a divinity would be visited by a large number of people to be honored and worshipped. Its life-size reproduction can be admired in the garden of the Chavin Museum and leveled over a wall. The aspect of the Jaguar God incredibly resembles the Viracocha depictions. Stumpy legs, large belly and large head out of proportion to his body. Is this only a casual coincidence? Could it be another trace of the passage of the mythical Viracochas? It is possible to access an intricate underground network of corridors, halls, narrow tunnels, air ducts and a water canalization from the open entrances at the top of the old temple and from others spread in various points. These are currently unusable, obstructed by debris and cavings. But once they connected the waters of the two rivers where Chavin de Huantar nestles in the middle. Huachexa overlooks Chavin and Mosna, which is at a lower height. The water descended from Huachexa and it would fill the large sunken square in front of the Castillo through its channels to finally flow in the Mosna. Could it be that such a sophisticated water network only had a ritual purpose? And could the Chavin underground be part of the legendary network of tunnels which connected ancient sites of a forgotten past? Mr. Lopez, archaeologist in charge of Chavin, states that there truly are underground tunnels which depart from Chavin towards other unexplored settlements of the surrounding mountains. The ancient Chavin population mentioned tunnels which connected an area northeast of here, about two kilometers away in the higher mountains. The ancient Chavin people spoke of this, so it is likely this connection truly exists. For the first time, video cameras have entered the tunnels in Chavin some of which are still unexplored. It's a difficult path, and the presence of bats makes it even less accessible. The network of underground tunnels is intricate, and the conjecture that the whole structure only had a religious purpose is increasingly less acceptable. Did the Chavin population really build the complex? Or did it simply settle in buildings it had found? Readapting these to its requirements? Buildings constructed by a population which had disappeared and with more advanced knowledge? The American archaeologist Ephraim George Squire in his book Peru, Incidents of Travel and Explorations in the Lands of Incas, published in 1887, believed that two distinct cultural eras existed in Peru's history. One, extremely ancient, with the most advanced scientific knowledge, and the other, much more recent, like that of the Incas, with a lower cultural level. According to Squire, an extremely hard to calculate span of time, but certainly broad, passed between these two cultures. He is also convinced that the ancient and sophisticated Peruvian finds are evidence of an advanced technology, heritage of a forgotten humanity. The tunnels unwind for still unknown distances, also due to the danger of covering them. 
Many are damaged or obstructed, and in fact, in the end, it becomes impossible to continue. Luckily, there are side exits, which suddenly emerge from the large main square. The tunnels and the entire Chavin complex still remain an unsolved mystery, and the uncertainty of their real origins is increasingly more substantiated. Who really built these? Professor Walter Krickeberg, in his book, Alto American Cultures, sustains the most ancient and advanced pre-Columbian civilizations appear suddenly, apparently without any roots and preliminary stages. This can only be explained by an external impulse which influenced ancient America. An external impulse. Exactly what has been orally narrated by the ancient pre-Columbian populations. The Viracochas. Men of great knowledge and with extraordinary powers, with their white skin and beards, gave birth to civilization once more after the Great Flood. <laughs>